Well, thank you very much for staying with us as we continue with a little study of that whole issue of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Today in the church year is the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Now, when I was in the parish ministry, I really enjoyed this particular Sunday. Uh, for one thing, it indicated that summer's here. Uh, but it also summarized everything that we had been through. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the church year, um, as there are celebrations during the course of a regular year. So we have the church year, which actually begins about the first Sunday in December. And that is with Advent. And we say, someone is coming. Who's coming? And then we celebrate Christmas. And we say, well, Jesus came into the world. And then we go to the season of Epiphany. And we ask the question, who is Jesus? And then we go to the season of Lent. And we ask the question, what has he done? Uh, we talk about uh, Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then we come to Easter, that he has been raised from the dead 40 days later on a Thursday, which is uh, uh, very few churches celebrate Ascension Day on that particular Thursday, and then 10 days later, we go to Pentecost. Now, in teaching this with children, I would give them a, a mnemonic device for remembering, and it's the word ace leap. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost, ace leap. Now, after we go through all those festivals, we then have this summary Sunday in which we say all praise to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful summary Sunday, giving thanks to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for everything that he has done for us. And then we enter into what is called the non-festival half of the church year. It used to be Sundays after Trinity, and now it's Sundays after Pentecost, and um, first Sunday after second, third, fourth, fifth. And how long that season is depends upon uh, the date of Easter. Now, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. And many of those who object to the uh, word Trinity or triune would tell us, well, that's not found in the Bible. And they are exactly right. You will not find the word Trinity in the Bible. But you will find the three persons in the Godhead alluded to in the Bible. For example, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And if you know anything about Old Testament history, the word I am is another name for God, Yahweh. I am. Uh, he told Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And of course, the Jews crucified Jesus because he claimed to be God. And then Jesus said, I'm going to send you someone else. I'm going to send you another comforter. He was the first. Now I'm going to send you another one who is going to lead you into faith. So, we have clearly specified, uh, it's been clearly specified in the Bible that you have the Father to whom Jesus prayed, you have Jesus who claimed to be God, and you have the third person sent in the world to bring us to faith, namely the Holy Spirit. And so now you have these three persons. Well, the problem is Old Testament 
Judaism, the Bible, has always been monotheistic, meaning there is one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you have what is called the great Shema. Hear, O Israel. Shema uh, means hear, O Israel. Uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. Um, he is one, as opposed to the pluralism, the polytheism of those other nations. So now you have the issue. How can you say that there's a father and the son who claim to be God and the Holy Spirit who comes from God? How can you say these three persons are one God? And that remained the mystery. And from that, and I'll get into the history of that, um, from that developed the doctrine of the Trinity. There's no other way of looking at it, and it's very difficult to explain. We could talk about ice, steam, and water, three substances, the same substance, but that would be modalism, uh, each in a different mode. It would be a heresy. There is no clear uh, way of explaining how in the Godhead there is one essence of God, a singular essence, yet three persons who share that essence, three distinct persons. Now, that doctrine of the Trinity is very important. We distinguish groups as being Christian because they acknowledge the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, there are groups such as the Unitarians, um, the United Pentecostals, who are a Jesus-only group, and, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, when I was in New York, I had a lady knock on our door. She was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, she said, Jesus is not God. I said, the Bible clearly says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. She said, if you knew your Greek, you would understand that. I said, wait a minute, I got my Greek New Testament, and I showed it to her. She said, I don't want to talk to you. She left. I said, you knocked on my door. I followed her down the street. But anyway, <laughs> that's very important that there are groups who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. And then we declare that such groups are not a part of the fellowship of the Holy Christian Church. And so the doctrine of the Trinity has become that distinguishing mark of Christianity, that we believe that there's one God, a singular essence, with three persons. Now, let me, if you don't mind history, uh, let me share with you a little bit of how that doctrine came about. Um, for the first nearly 300, I'd say 270 years of Christian history, there was a great deal of confusion regarding the person of Jesus Christ, the relationship of that person to God. And there were various heresies. For example, the Docetists, they believed that Jesus didn't have a real body. He was more of kind of a phantom. Uh, the Sabellians believed in modalism, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were merely uh, different modes of God rather than distinct persons. The Marsonians in the second century said that the Christian God is not the same God as being in the Old Testament. Uh, and then you had the adoptionists who believed that Jesus was adopted into the family of God at his baptism when God said, this is my beloved son. You had all these groups. You had all of these ideas throughout the Christian world. But at that time, Christianity was persecuted, so there was no way of getting everybody together and saying, let's settle this issue once and for all. The opportunity didn't exist. 
because the status of the Christian church was dependent upon who was the Roman emperor at the time. One Roman emperor might have permitted Christianity, the next one would come along and persecute them. A very important date in which God intervened, and I say God intervened, I, I truly believe that this is a very important intervention of God. And the year is 312. Um, the Emperor Theodosius had died in 305. He was a severe persecutor of Christians. Constantine was accepted as the next emperor, but there were those who did not accept them, and one of the men in particular was a man by the name of Maxentius. And they met for battle uh, at the Melivian Bridge, which is a bridge over the Tiber River leading into Rome. So as Constantine is marching, and this whole story comes from the church father Eusebius, who said that Constantine told him this. So as Constantine was marching, during the day he looked up into the sun and he saw a cross and the letters in Latin, in hoc signo vinces, written underneath it. And that night in a dream, he was told what to do. Now, the Latin words in hoc signo vinces mean in this sign conquer. Um, for whatever it's worth, if you ever find a pack of Pall Mall cigarettes, you'll find an image in the middle, and underneath will be the words in hoc signo vinces. Why, I don't know, but they're there. In this sign, conquer. And of course, it meant the cross. Now, Constantine then had crosses and also the Cairo uh, inscribed onto their shields, their standards, and you know what the Cairo is, the P with the X. Uh, you've all seen that. Uh, X is the Greek letter CH, and the P stands for the Greek letter Rho, which is R, which are the first two letters of the word Christ. Uh, when people send you a Christmas card and they wish you Merry Xmas, they are not crossing out Christ, because the symbol of X, the first two letters of the word Christ, has always been used as shorthand. I remember I had a professor in a seminary who used to write Christianity by, say, by writing X-I-A-N-I-T-Y, uh, putting the X, which is a symbol for Christ. And so he went to battle with the cross, with the Cairo on the shields, and he won the battle, came back to Rome victoriously, has now the sole emperor of the Roman Empire and declared that Christianity was now an accepted religion in Rome. By the way, Constantine's mother, Helena, was a Christian, and in the uh, beginning of the 4th century, she journeyed to the Holy Land and she built a number of basilicas or little churches over the sites. Any, any of you been to Israel? Some of you have. Now, if you've been to the church of the Nativity, when you went into that church through that little opening, there you came upon a section where there was a hole in the floor, and you looked down and you saw the original mosaic from Helena, uh, who put up the original basilica over the site where Jesus was born. And by that time, of course, people knew where Jesus was born. So Christianity now became the, I wouldn't say official, but an accepted religion within Rome. And Constantine, the emperor, was a Christian who, by the way, 
chose not to get baptized until the moment before he died, which was very interesting. But anyway, now, Constantine looked at the state of the Christian church and said, look, you guys, you got to get your act together. The major heresy at this time was Arianism. Arius was a prelate from uh, Alexandria, and Arius taught that Jesus was inferior to the Father, very similar to what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach today. And Arius was shrewd. He um, promulgated his views not just with propositions, but he wrote little ditties, little jingles, little choruses. Jesus is not God. And, and people got to love these little jingles of Arius. And, uh, and the populace sang them. They sang them in bar rooms and so forth. And there are some who suggest that the little jingles of Arius became popular also with sailors because Alexandria was a major seaport so that the heresy spread from port to port. And this was a major problem. Uh, there are some who believe that Jesus was God. Others following Arius said, no, he's inferior to God. So Constantine said, look, get this straightened out. And so a conference was called the first great ecumenical conference uh, in the city of Nicaea, which is in Turkey. And all the leaders of the church came together, these bishops, and they're often described as some of them were missing a leg, uh, some had their eyes gouged out due to the persecution, and they all came to Nicaea to deal with this question. And they studied the Bible. They poured over Scripture. And they finally came out with a confession. Now, the Nicene Creed we have today is a little bit later version. But in their version, they said that Jesus is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance with the Father, by whom the entire world was made. And so the Council of Nicaea rejected Arianism as a heresy and put into place the triune nature of God. There are three persons in the Godhead, one divine essence, three persons came out of the Council of Nicaea as they poured over the Word of God. Now, one of the other issues that was settled at Nicaea was the date of Easter. This, I find this interesting. Um, the Christians at that time, to begin with, were following the Jewish calendar because they knew that Jesus died at Passover. And so when the Jews celebrated Passover, the Christians celebrated Easter. Well, many Christians said, we've got to divorce ourselves from the Jewish calendar. And so they devised <laughs> this little scheme for dating Easter. It was a first Sunday after the first full moon, after the first day of spring. The first Sunday, after the first full moon, after the first day of spring. I guarantee you, 100% guarantee you, that when you come to church on Good Friday, if it's a clear night, I absolutely, 100% guarantee there will be a full moon. There has to be. So that means that Easter can actually 
be as early, I guess, as March 23rd. Uh, if the 21st is Friday, if the full moon is Saturday, March 23rd could possibly be the very earliest. And I guess the latest, if you figure it out, um, April 20th would be the end of the cycle. And if, and if that falls on a Monday, probably Easter could be as late as April 27th. And so the feast varies. And if you are interested sometime, you can look in your hymnal and they will give you in the hymnal all the dates of Easter. I remember as a kid, we had the 1940 hymnal and they went up to the year 2000. And as a kid, I was sitting there thinking, boy, I'll be 60 at that time. I hope I'm still alive. <laughs> well, now it's 20 years later. Uh, but if you go in your hymnal, and some place in there, there are the dates for Easter. Nicaea settled that in 325 A.D. Now, this didn't really settle the whole issue. Because now the question became, if Jesus is God, he is also man. He became incarnate in the Virgin Mary. Um, how do those natures work together? He's true God. He's true man. By the way, we believe that Mary is the mother of God. That's called the Theotokos, the, the God-bearer that Mary is the mother of God. Very interesting. Now, Rome, and I'm in a rabbit hole here, Rome has four planks of Marian theology. The first plank is Mary is the mother of God. We agree with that. But then they go on and say that she was a perpetual virgin. Well, I don't know about that. There are verses in Scripture that talk about the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Uh, Luther believed in the perpetual virginity. There are some Lutheran pastors who believe. There are most, I guess, would say that there were brothers and sisters. What do you say, Tom? Brothers and sisters? You don't know. Uh, <laughs> so the, the issue, uh, I'm talking to Pastor Tom Romer, for those of you who have no idea what I'm doing. Um, the, the issue of the perpetual virginity, a plank accepted by Rome. Then you have the next plank, which is the um, uh, Immaculate Conception. Now, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, I remember one time it was a Feast of Immaculate Conception. My wife went to work. Most of the people she worked with in New York were Roman Catholic. I said, ask them a question. Who's Immaculate Conception? Are they celebrating? And everyone said, Jesus. No. The Feast of Jesus was not immaculately conceived. He was incarnated, which is different. The Feast of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary was immaculately conceived in the womb of her mother, Anne, or Anna. If you ever think, do you know of any Roman Catholic churches that are, let's say, St. Joachim and Anne? Uh, Joachim or Joachim and Anne were the father and mother of Mary. Mary was immaculately conceived, in, and I believe it was 1912, I believe, I could be wrong, when the... Uh, Bodily assumption of Mary uh, was made a dogma in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it's interesting that, that much of the idea regarding the bodily assumption that Mary was now up in heaven with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, much of that, or I should say some of that, I don't know what percentage, came out of mystical vision. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila saw this mystical vision of Mary being the queen of heaven. But those are the four planks. We believe Mary is the mother of God. We reject the other three, uh, primarily the last two, because there's absolutely no biblical warrant for that. So the question becomes, how 
do these two natures interact? Jesus is not 50% God and 50% man. He's 100% God and 100% man. Uh, the personal union, the God-man, the Son of God, these two natures exist within the person of Jesus Christ. Now, how do those natures interact? Very important question. I'm sure that there are folks who might think that, well, when Jesus slept, when Jesus wept, um, when Jesus ate, when Jesus died, he did so according to his human nature. When Jesus healed the sick, when he walked on water, when he stilled the storm, when he cast out demons, when he was raised from the dead, he did it according to his divine nature. Well, no, because that creates a problem. Um, set up a scale of justice for a second in your mind. You know what I mean? The two, the two pans with the bar and put into this side all of the sins that have ever been committed from day one until the end of the age. Put them in the one pan, and so that pan goes down. Now, put in the other pan the suffering and death of Jesus. Um, without even going into the idea of bearing the sins of the world, I do believe that there have been other individuals throughout history who have experienced greater torture a greater suffering than perhaps Jesus did on the cross. So could you put the, oh, six hours of suffering of Jesus, uh, maybe include Monday, Thursday, according to his human nature alone in this pan and have it balance the other? Our brothers and sisters in the Reformed Church say Jesus died according to his human nature only. And I would say, well, that would cause me a problem. Because I really don't know if the shed blood of Jesus, according to his human nature alone, is sufficient to balance the scales so that the justice of God is met, and the world of sinners is forgiven. You know what I mean? Is that enough? The only way it could be enough is if you put God in this pan. If the shed blood on the cross was the divine blood of the Son of God, zoom! It's more than enough to balance the scales for our forgiveness. So anytime you're in doubt regarding your forgiveness, you can claim that my forgiveness is based upon the shed divine blood of the Son of God. You see, you cannot say, or else I, I don't believe you can say, and comfort people by saying Jesus only died according to his human nature. Because then they would have to ask the question, is that sufficient to balance the scales? Once you put God into the pan, the precious shed blood of the one person God and man, Jesus Christ, into the pan. Well, how do I know my sins are fully forgiven? Because God did it. God did it. Now, this idea was a part of the church in the second century church father, Tertullian, 
spoke of the fact that God was truly crucified and truly died. The issue wasn't settled until the next two ecumenical councils met at Ephesus in 431 and Chalcedon in 451. And out of those two councils came an understanding that we speak of as the communication of attributes. I'm sorry, that's what it's called. The sharing of attributes, meaning that the attributes of the divine nature are communicated to, shared with, the human nature. So that when Jesus wept, God wept. When Jesus was sorrowful over Jerusalem, that was the heart of God. When Jesus picked up little children and held them to himself, that is what God believed and acts regarding little children. So what Jesus did, he didn't do only according to his human nature, because the attributes of the divine nature are a part of the human. You can't cut him in half and say, now he's human, now he's God. He had to do everything according to both Natures. Well, you say, how can God die? God can do whatever God chooses to do. And if God, in Christ Jesus, chose to participate in the suffering and death of his son, I'm sure glad he did. Because of that, I can be assured that my sins are forgiven. I can be assured of the truth of the gospel. I can be assured that I'm righteous before God. Why am I assured? Because God did it. God did it. That's why the doctrine of the Trinity particularly the person of Jesus Christ and the relationship between his divine and human nature. Well, I know they're all theological issues, but I believe that whatever I learned at the seminary, I should be able to teach Grandma Schmidt, whoever that is. Because if I can't communicate that to you, <laughs> why in the world did I learn it? And that whole issue of the interrelationship of the person, the divine and the human in the person of Jesus Christ is something you need to understand so that when Good Friday comes along, you are declaring that that death on the cross involved the participation of God for the sins of the world. And then you can be assured that your sins are definitely forgiven. Martin Luther said, the greatest blasphemy is to deny your sins are forgiven. Why? Because God did it. God presents and offers this gift of this great forgiveness to us. I hope this has been helpful and understanding on this feast of the Holy Trinity how important that understanding is that we have one God who have a singular divine essence but that one God is made up of three persons Father Son and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. You have these three distinct persons sharing the one divine essence. And when you get to heaven, <laughs> you'll see it with your own eyes. God bless you. Have a happy Trinity Sunday. Thank you so much for
staying with us and tuning in.